on these big mountains, we're taking big risks. We need to be aware of those risks and mitigate those risks to the greatest level we can. And we have to know when it's time to go home. I know if I disappear on a mountain, I'm just gone. It's those people at home, it's my family, that it's gonna affect their lives for years and years to come. And while that might happen inevitably because of something I didn't plan and I accept that risk, I just never want it to be because I knew it and I pushed on anyway. Eight thousand. For most people, a perfectly innocent, somewhat meaningless number. But for mountain climbers, it can be the number that defines their lives forever. There are only 14 mountain peaks on Earth that stand taller than 8,000 meters. All of them lie in the Himalayan and Karakoram ranges in Central Asia. They're the only mountains on the planet that tower into an area called the death zone where the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is insufficient to sustain human life. Yet despite the danger and objective hazards of the world's tallest mountains, every year teams of alpinists come from around the world to try to reach these summits. It is a calling for some, almost a religion for others. The chance to truly test one's own limits and do what so few have done before. In the Karakoram Range on the border of China and Pakistan stands K2, the world's second highest peak, standing at 8,611 meters or 28,251 feet. It is widely considered to be the world's most difficult mountain to climb. Climbers regard K2 as the ultimate achievement in mountaineering, and for good reason. More people have been to outer space than have stood on its summit. In the 117 years of expeditions to K2, from 1902 to June of 2019, less than 400 people have ever reached the summit of K2 and lived to talk about it. After the third American K2 expedition in 1953, outfitted by Eddie Bauer, climber George Bell told reporters, K2 is a savage mountain that tries to kill you, giving the mountain the nickname it carries to this very day, the Savage Mountain. Of all of the peaks over 8,000 meters, K2 has the second highest fatality rate next to Annapurna. Approximately one person dies on K2 for every four who reach the summit. But K2 isn't some malevolent being. It's indifferent to suffering, but it isn't cruel. Its environment is hostile, but it isn't angry. It doesn't have a voice, but it does speak. One of the greatest lessons a climber can learn is how to listen to the mountain. Professional mountain guide Adrian Ballinger has spent the majority of his adult life climbing and guiding in the high Himalaya. As the founder and CEO of Alpenglow Expeditions, Adrian has spent his career helping others live their adventure on the big mountains of the world. Second. About to go up. Almost all of my climbing on 8,000 meter peaks was with supplemental oxygen, bottled oxygen. Finally, in 2016, I really wanted to test myself to my true limits in the biggest mountains. And that's why I tried Everest without supplemental oxygen. I failed and almost got myself killed only a couple of hours from the summit after a two-month expedition, battling cold and energy levels up high. 
even though I was very disappointed in that experience, it was exactly what I had come for, and it led to me putting the entire next year, putting guiding on hold, my company on hold. I went back in 2017 with my same Eddie Bauer team and summited without oxygen. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Getting to the summit I knew I could do, getting down was really actually pretty scary for me. It was pretty hard and I needed all of my teammates to keep me awake, to keep me moving. I kind of found that limit, that line. If Everest had been 50 feet higher, I truly don't know if I could have gotten on top of it. And so it's taken two years since that experience to kind of build that feeling back up, to be willing to work that hard again. I've trained for a full year, been really focused on my diet and my physical training to come in as strong as I possibly can for this mountain that I know has uh, increased risk and that the one thing that makes you safest here is speed. You have to be fast. Although it is only 237 meters lower than Everest, K2 is much more difficult to climb. The terrain is steep, requiring advanced mountaineering skills in both rock and ice climbing. The exposure is extreme in places where even the smallest mistake could prove fatal. Bad weather is common, and the risk of avalanche and rockfall is high. And on top of that, the high altitude and lack of oxygen make it hard to breathe. Professional climbers find that kind of challenge intoxicating. It's the kind of fuel that stokes their fire a test to be taken by those who believe they have what it takes to reach the summit. There's a lot more risk attached to K2 than let's say Mount Everest. And so I never wanted to go without the right people. And Carla Perez and Topo Esteban Mena and Paldin Namge and Pemba, these are people I just trust implicitly and I've spent so much time in the mountains with that when they finally invited me, you know, really this was Kala and Topo's trip originally, and they invited me on the trip and it was like, it just all of a sudden it was like, it's absolutely the right time. As a certified Ecuadorian mountain guide, Carla Perez has guided on big mountains all over the world. She has successfully summited three of the 14 8,000 meter peaks, and she's done each one without using supplemental oxygen. Manaslu in 2012, Cho'oyu in 2014, and Everest in 2016. Now I have been climbing for 20 years. I think in these trips, most of the time you are really close to death, and you, you really face the death. So you want to enjoy more your life, enjoy more the people. And all these small details and things in life that sometimes we didn't think about. But then when we are there and we are scared and we are really close to that, we feel that these small things are the really, real important things. It's actually Carla and I are trying without oxygen. And then we have three team members who are supporting us up high. That's Topo. Paulden and Pemba, they'll actually all be using supplemental oxygen, which helps them make clearer decisions and gives them more power and strength while we know we're struggling for our lives up there. And I'm at a point in my career where I, I want to have help making those impossible decisions up high when things go wrong. Previously, the greatest number of climbers to attempt K2 in a single season was 80. But in 2019, Pakistan issued more permits than ever before no less than 200 climbers would be attempting to reach the summit of K2, and for many, it would be their first time climbing on a peak above 8,000 meters. This year, we have more people trying to climb K2. I'm not sure uh, how many they want to try without oxygen or how many they want to try with oxygen, but for sure, in this mountain that is more technical, we will have more uh, neck bottles, traffic jams, and that is a dangerous thing. That intimidates me. On this mountain, you need to be independent, you need to be fast, you need to know everything instinctually when the shit hits the fan, which it inevitably does on this mountain every year. And I don't believe you can have the level of experience necessary to do that without at least three 8,000 meter peaks before coming here. And that's what I'm already, you, I'm getting on my soapbox. That's what I'm getting fired up about. It's, it's not that people shouldn't be here and that we can't have more people in the mountains playing. It's that you need the experience to stay alive. Thank you. 
June 19, 2019, Skardu, Pakistan. Over 40 duffels and barrels of food, climbing gear and equipment necessary for the expedition would accompany the team into the Karakaram. As they would soon discover, just trekking into K2 base camp would be an adventure of its own. It's meant to be a pretty wild six to seven hour four wheel drive Jeep road up into the mountains. <laughs> but the drop's not that far. Yeah, it's not too bad. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Look at this right here. Oh, dude, this is not cool. Once we get to Ascole, we'll meet all of our porters and local staff organize all of our loads, and then begin a seven-day walk to base camp. We're joining with a few other teams to get to base camp, and we'll probably have a few hundred local porters with us. So it's gonna be like a village or a city traveling together up the valley. And what everyone says, the walk is long. I think it's about 90 kilometers. You're doing big distances each day, starting quite low, so it's gonna be hot and then quickly getting onto the glaciers. So you're actually trekking along the side of the glaciers all the way up into the mountains and finally to K2 Base Camp, which sits at the end of the valley. It had been less than a month since Carla and Adrian were working and guiding on Mount Everest. While each of them used bottled oxygen while guiding their clients, the two months spent at extreme altitude had taken a physical and mental toll on both of them. As a result, they were beginning this expedition to K2 in a weaker state than any other part of their year. Our team is really focusing on just recovering. Kala, Topo, and I have all had just pretty wild travel schedules the past couple of weeks. We were all on Everest this spring and just finished and then got home for a few days. And now we're here, it's been a whirlwind. Hope we get to see a little bit of the culture, meet some of these mountain people who work so hard up here and live up here year round, and just sort of settle into the rhythm of our team. It's so important on a big trip like this just to get into a rhythm together. But midway through the trek to base camp at a camp called Goro 2, that rhythm was disrupted severely when Adrian suddenly fell extremely ill overnight. It would be the first of many setbacks and red flags that the team would face over the next month on the mountain. Well, that sucked. I went from being on cloud nine on this track to last night getting as sick as I think I've been since like I was 22 backpacking through India. <laughs> uh, you don't want the gory details. Maybe you do. Both ends, real rough non-stop, and then got so cold that I couldn't stop shivering. Even though we're only at 14,000 feet, <clears throat> Topo Kala, Pemba, and Paladin ended up totally taking care of me. Came in the kitchen to fire up a bunch of water so I could have hot water bottles, and just went through a legit hellish night. But I think I'm turning the corner. I haven't puked and two hours, which is a record since 11 p.m. last night. So we're staying, we're not moving up to Broad Peak Base Camp today with the rest of the group, which I was so excited to do, to see friends there, but uh, we're skipping it. I think we're gonna spend two more nights here in uh, Goro 2, and I hope that'll get me, you know, back on track. So not only can I move and walk, but that I can walk to K2 Base Camp and be not completely shattered. As commercial climbing teams pressed on with the porters toward K2 base camp, Adrian's team stayed behind at Goro 2 and waited for him to get his strength back. As they waited, intimidating reports began to trickle in about what lay ahead. We've been hearing nothing but negatives. You know, the most snow in 30 years on the mountain and in the Karakoram. Uh, still heavy snowing now, loads of snow at base camp. Then we've heard about this big avalanche that already wiped out one team's camp and already sent a K2 team home. And we've heard about missing climbers on another mountain just two days away from us that we assume were by avalanche. Uh, so, you know, the cooks are telling us like, bad season, bad season, not the year to go. No go, no go. And I, I feel like I want to take the same approach I've taken to every mountain I've ever, ever taken. And that's, you know, to, to go until the mountain tells me I can't go anymore. Three days later, Adrian was back on his feet, 
strong enough to walk, but the porters returning from K2 base camp refused to take them up the valley. The dozens of commercial teams whom they had escorted to base camp just days before had failed to follow protocol and had tipped them poorly for the work they did on the difficult week-long trek. And when we say bad tip, we mean for seven day trek in a very hard way, in a very hard trail, two dollars <laughs> per, per, per bag. That's very bad because it's what's, nothing. What's a good tip? I think at least $10, $15, that is already not much, but they like that, $10 or $15 per bag when you arrive to base camp from Ascoli, like seven days trekking. Adrian and Carla suddenly found themselves innocent bystanders in a full-on porter strike. We've been stuck for three nights, trying to persuade some porters and horses coming down to please take us to K2 base camp. Beautiful weather, but they've had a really hard time climbing, so they're uh, not super excited to go back up again. <laughs> but right now, we're feeling pretty stranded. After convincing a small group of 15 porters that they would be well compensated for taking them to K2 base camp, the team was, once again, on the move. But the agonizing stomach bug that had plagued Adrian days before came screaming back. Despite how much it hurt, Adrian suffered through it to get to K2 base camp, as the team was already an entire week behind schedule. Any further delays would put the team in jeopardy and not allow them enough time to climb the mountain. With K2 base camp finally in sight, the mountain seemed to greet them with a dire warning. Walking into base camp on K2, and of course the first thing we see, huge avalanche cloud covering the route to, from base camp to the base of the Abruzzi. Shit. However, so close to his lifelong dream of climbing K2, Adrian could only see positives upon their arrival. Well, here we are. Track took 50% longer than we kind of planned on due to sickness and then orders leaving us, but take a look. There's Kala and K2 Base Camp just beyond. It's big. It is so exciting, right below the mountain, coming out of the clouds now. Your Bruzy Ridge kind of for the skyline. So stoked to be here. With the porters well compensated and the team's tents finally set up at base camp, the time had come to start climbing. Adrian made the decision to forego rest and join the team on a scouting mission. Although he had lost 10 pounds since his illness, he wouldn't let it prevent him from getting his first real look at the base of K2. Well, it hurts, but I'm still following Kala. <laughs> trying to keep up. We just got to the base of Bruzy Rude. That's what we wanted to check out today. They planned to climb to Camp 1, and do a light survey of the Abruzzi route. But things took a turn for the worse only a few hours in. Halfway on the way to Camp One, on a warming morning, it's had a pretty real wet slide. We saw two people caught in it, but we think they got out. But it's running hard and fast. Nice first day up there, reminding us this mountain is not going to be easy, even when the weather seems perfect. So, back to base camp. Tail slightly between our legs. Well, it's July 4th. We're at K2 base camp. 5,000 meters, 16.5. We had a good little adventure yesterday. Got a little bit of feel of the Abruzzi route and some of the hazards of the mountain. Today, a little bit cloudy. Um, I am on my third antibiotic course, but this one seems to maybe be working. I woke up without the uh, gnarly burps and other symptoms you don't need to hear about. So that's good news. The bad news, collar went downhill. I think she got a little sick. She's recovering now, she's smiling. <laughs> 
but uh, we really need to be healthy to be able to move fast on K2, so we might be holding off another day or two until we move. Boys, Topo, Baldwin, and Pemba might go for an adventure tomorrow. As Carla and Adrian took a day to rest and recover, Topo, Paulden, and Pemba set out on the less crowded but more technical Chesson route in order to establish the team's high camps. K2 is a really technical steep route with very small campsites, just little ledges where you can set tents on the upper mountain, and there are no other choices. On K2, Setting up a high camp without the protection of a ridge or rock wall would be like building your house in the middle of a freeway. Exposed camps on steep slopes are in constant danger of being struck by avalanche or rockfall. So what do you do when you're one of the last teams up the mountain and all of the safe campsites have been claimed? If you're experienced mountain guides like Topo, Pemba, and Paulden, you grab some empty rice sacks and improvise. What we did is we built like platforms with the uh, rice hacks. Uh -huh. A lot of the people came and they are in the very center yeah. of the spot. We built two terraces on, on an area that nothing existed. Perfect. Yes. And you think they're strong enough that they're not going to collapse? Very strong. We put like pitons and awesome. we spent a long time. You, so you set two tents? So we set one tent, our tent, and the other we just left uh, the platform with uh, the duffel bag. So it is claimed. So it's claimed. Great job, dude. Great Three work, hours, you guys. Huh? Yeah, it was pretty. Three hours to make the platform? Yeah. Oh my God. That's gonna make a big difference for tomorrow. And do you totally. think you While camps set higher on the mountain certainly offer up more spectacular views, the necessity behind them has more to do with science than with scenery. Spending prolonged periods in a low oxygen environment stimulates red blood cell production in the human body. The more red blood cells there are, the more oxygen they can carry to the brain and vital organs, even when the air is thin. This is called acclimatization. There are no shortcuts to the top of any mountain, especially when climbing without supplemental oxygen. And because every individual is different, Proper acclimatization at extreme altitude takes patience, persistence, and a lot of practice. Kala and I have both climbed Everest without supplemental oxygen, and it took both of us two tries to do that before being successful. And so I think we both had a real idea of what we wanted for our bodies to acclimatize, and we really didn't want to short circuit that system or like skip any steps. We wanted a minimum of two big rotations on the mountain before summit push. And we both wanted to get as high as we could, spend a bunch of nights up high, and ideally sleep at Camp 4 at 7,800 meters before our summit push. Well, day six of our colonization rotation at 23,000 feet. We are packing up. It's still nighttime because we got a little scared. Bunch of snow last night, we think. Really warm temps. So we're gonna get off the slope, get off the mountain before the sun hits it at seven. Why are you smiling? <laughs> because he's fun. <laughs> it's so damn fun. Being teammates with Kala and Topo is really a dream and, and has been for, for years as we've built our friendship and working relationship and climbing relationship together. You know, when I see them deal with stress and risk, their decision making is so on point and they're so focused, but at the same time, their attitude is just right. It's easy to be around, it keeps me feeling confident. Topo, what are you doing? Yeah, 21,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> My brother got excited. <laughs> that mindset in the big mountains, especially without oxygen, where inevitably we're all going to feel like the worst we've ever felt in our lives, having that kind of like stoke and passion and belief that we can still succeed is uh, it, it's so important. It's immeasurable. <laughs> We're hanging on the tent. We might have carbon monoxide poisoning because Carla says we might have died last night. But our souls are still very happy and they went climbing today to Camp 3. 
<laughs> and uh, souls are enjoying the view. <laughs> they're just good humans. They care about the people around them. When they're asking you questions, you know they're listening and, and interested. And there's nothing fake or pretend there. And I feel like I'd spend every day with them if I could in the mountains guiding and climbing and, uh, and just having fun. Debris pile, the bottom of the chest and root. Much, much taller than I am. This is the spot where you just go as fast as you can. Hope it's not your day. It's not my day. It's gonna be all right. It's 4.30 a.m. on July 14th the start of the team's second acclimatization rotation, where Carla, Adrian, and Topo will spend the next four days living at the highest camps on the mountain, enduring two nights at Camp 3 at 7,200 meters, then climbing to 7,800 meters to suffer through a hard and painful night acclimatizing at Camp 4. It's gonna be interesting today. Today's the first day we're seeing a big rush of people, summit teams, Heading out on both routes. So we'll be interested to see if it changes the character of the climbing. Possible rock fall, possible ice fall. Possibly having to get creative. Good weather windows are rare in the Karakaram range, especially on K2. Weather conditions are unpredictable because K2 rises so much higher than the mountains around it. It touches the upper atmosphere, so it can create eddies in the jet stream like a rock jutting out of a raging river. So when weather conditions are favorable, that's the signal for most teams to attempt their summit push. We're definitely in stress mode now, but really just because of unknowns, right? Lots of teams are trying to go to the summit in this three day good weather period now. It's kind of hard not to be going and to be afraid that we might miss the one window. But the reality is, we got to acclimatize. So, hanging out, trying to stay patient, see what happens. Getting ready to move early today in our down suits for the first time. Wow. Trying to make it uh, 25,500 feet and spend a night. The last people we talked to did it on oxygen and eight plus hours, so. We're a little intimidated, but just gotta start walking. Up, up, up. Headed to camp four. Work is real now. Everybody asks. No, these are not oxygen masks. But we have found them pretty key to climbing without oxygen. They capture humidity and warmth as you breathe out. So then the next breath you breathe in is already pre-warmed. Makes a huge difference to not getting this bad a cough up here when you might be breathing 40 or more times a minute. Plus, they look pretty cool, right? On the way to Camp 4, the team got an up-close and personal look at one of the deadliest features on the mountain. Finally getting a look at the beast. The bottleneck Serac. This is a huge ice cliff up and left of Topo and Kala. And unfortunately, the route goes right under it. The mountains felt pretty safe up until getting a view of that thing. But right now, luckily, we don't have to make any decisions about that. All we gotta do is the last little stretch to camp four, and then figure out <coughs> how we're gonna survive tonight. <laughs> and not freeze, and not die of high altitude sickness. We made it! We did it, Gala! Camp four! Yeah! As the team hunkered down for the night at Camp 4, dozens of commercial teams from all over the world began their bids for the summit. Although the weather conditions were still ideal, 
every team encountered the same insurmountable obstacles on their summit push. Well, I pretty much knew last night would be the hardest night of the season, and at least for me, and it lived up to its reputation. Sleeping at 25,500 feet. We'd only slept at 22.5 before this because of where the safe campsites are. It sucked. Super cold. Got a headache. Couldn't sleep. And in the meantime, all the climbers who tried to go to the summer last night, from what we can tell, all failed. There were lots of reports of two meter deep unconsolidated snow. There were three or four reports of different avalanches taking different Sherpa and team members out. No one killed, but it's hard to know exactly what those avalanches look like, but it's still not good. So I don't really want to be on a 40 degree avalanche slope with no protection at 27,000 feet while climbing without oxygen. That, those are not the margins of safety that I'm looking for. These kind of conditions doesn't change from one day to another. Yeah. Even in a week, because it's super high and there's a lot of snow and it's, the weather will be the same for one week. So probably in our summit push, we will find the same conditions. But yeah, we are here to enjoy, to learn. And <laughs> are you enjoying right now? Yeah, and to celebrate <laughs> the 100th anniversary of Eddie Power. Oh. And the 10th anniversary oh, of Oh, you're Persia. so good. <laughs> So, yeah, we will try to celebrate in the best way, but in the same way. Yeah, and yeah, I'm super happy and grateful to be here with Adrian Bollinger and Topo Mena, the <laughs> best teammates. We're definitely the only <laughs> team on the mountain that acclimatized by sleeping at Camp 4. And I'm <laughs> so confident it's the right thing, but man, it hurts. Having survived the brutal conditions of Camp 4, Adrian, Carla, and Topo returned to a base camp in chaos. Failing even to break trail and route to the summit, most of the remaining commercial teams felt that success was no longer possible. Over the next two days, the majority of them would pack up and go home. K2 Base Camp, with over 150 tents spread out over a half kilometer of rock-covered glacier, went from this to this. With their confidence shattered and the obstacle in front of them seemingly too big to overcome, the team had a decision to make. They could pack up and leave with the rest of the climbers, or they could stay and hope for a miracle. I sort of came into the season knowing that it was going to be hard and dangerous and uh, having heard countless stories about the Karakoram and and having lost friends here that I know were super experienced and super talented climbers on K2 and other mountains. And so all along, I've kind of told myself that failure is okay and that we all fail and that we just keep taking these small steps towards success and, and that hopefully it comes. And even when it doesn't, the experiences are really, really powerful. Their plan was to rest and recover for an entire week so that they would be as strong as possible for their summit attempt. But after only one day of rest, on the 20th of July, the team received another piece of disheartening news. The professional Swiss meteorologists that the team had hired to monitor the ever-changing weather patterns in the Karakaram sent them this weather model. The white areas represent clear skies and sun, while the green represents snow and massive showstopper storms. If Adrian and Carla wanted to reach the summit of K2, they only had a four-day window before their season was over. On July 21st, Carla and Topo made their way to Camp 2, while Adrian stayed behind for one more day of rest, rehydration, and hot meals. At 3 a.m. on July 22nd, he, Paulden, and Pemba made their way out of base camp and covered 6,500 vertical feet where he would meet up with Carla and Topo at Camp 3. During this ascent at 5.30 a.m., Adrian got a glimpse of a very troubling sight high on the mountain. Looking up at the mountain, we're seeing a lot more wind off the ridge 
then the forecast predicted kind of matching the most negative model instead of the most positive model and uh we need low wind for no oxygen climbing up high so it's fine for today but uh hopefully it changes for tomorrow the next day otherwise it's not gonna work it was the first time they had seen wind all season as the team reached Camp 3, they had no idea whether or not the 100 mile an hour winds that hammered the top of the mountain had made it more or less dangerous up high. The only thing they knew for certain was that the conditions had changed. They wouldn't know exactly how much until they began their summit push. You can tell I'm hypoxic, I can't think of what to say, but... Pretty perfect night still, hopefully. We got one hour until we start walking. And I'm just hoping that slope up there is friendly because the weather's good and we've worked hard for this. And now we want a shot. So here we go, 11.30 at night. Alden's ready. <laughs> Beppa's ready. <coughs> Call is also ready. Topo's closing up the tent. Time to go try hard. The wind has definitely had its way with this slope. Basically, hanging out on a hard slab. That section hurt a lot. It's steep. It's afraid of avalanches. I'm afraid the wind might have frosted my cornea so I can't see out of one eye. Oh. Other than that, it's awesome. Now above 8,300 meters, 27,000 feet. Slope that stopped everyone last week. Sure enough, has been wind hammered. Lots of ice showing now. It's got plenty of exposure to ice fall still, but it's feeling pretty darn okay. Stripped off down suits, sewed on on. And we're uh, moving on up. Paulden and I just topped out <laughs> under the bottleneck rack. Five hours under this fucking thing. No May Gusta. Oh fuck. Definitely had to suspend leave for a few hours. It's Topo coming up. Paul and his sister on the corner. That was full on. <sighs> Scary. Hard. I'm gonna try to get around to a safe spot around the corner and reassess. I think I'm six hours in so far, and it hurts. <sighs> we just finished the last steep slope on K2. We have a long way to go. I'm totally emotional. Evan, Evan, this is 
Just can't believe it. We're at over 8,400 meters. Perfect day. Only seven of us up here. It's feeling awful good. Still a lot of work to go. A couple hours to the summit. And we gotta get down safe. But it's a special moment right now. Hey Dean, can you see us? We got to the end of the rope, which means that we should be 30 meters away from the summit. 30 meters in distance. We are almost there, guys. protect us for this cold. Mwah. Thank you so much for trusting me, for helping me, and let's celebrate on base camp.